in which our lovers begin to learn the consequences of their actions. Chapter 5 After breakfast, Levine landed not in his former place in the line, but between an old joker who invited him to be his neighbor and a young music married only since autumn, for whom it was his first summer of mowing. The old man, holding himself erect, went ahead, mowing his turned-out feet steadily and widely, and in a precise and steady movement that apparently cost him no more effort than swinging his arms while walking as if in play, lay down a tall, uniform swath. Just as though it were not him, but the sharp scythe alone that swished through the succulent grass. Behind Levine came young Mishka, his fair young face with a wisp of fresh grass bound round his hair, worked all over with the effort. But as soon as anyone looked at him, he smiled. He clearly would sooner have died than admit it was hard for him. Levine went between them. In this hottest time the mowing did not seem so hard to him. The sweat that drenched him cooled him off, and the sun, burning on his back, head and arm with its sleeve rolled to the elbow, gave him firmness and perseverance in his work. More and more often those moments of unconsciousness came, when it was possible for him not to think of what he was doing. The scythe cut by itself. These were happy moments. More joyful still were the moments when, coming to the river, where the swaths ended, the old man would wipe his scythe with thick, wet grass, rinse its steel in the cool water, dip his whetstone box, and offer it to Levine. Have a sip of my kvass. Good, eh? he said with a wink. And indeed, Levine had never before drunk such a drink as this warm water, with green floating in it and tasting of the rusty tin box. And right after that came a blissfully slow walk with scythe in hand, during which he could wipe off the streaming sweat, fill his lungs with air, look at the whole stretched outline of mowers and at what was going on around him in the woods and fields. The longer Levine mowed, the more often he felt those moments of oblivion during which it was no longer his arms that swung the scythe, but the scythe itself that lent motion to his whole body, full of life and conscious of itself, and, as if by magic, without a thought of it, the work got rightly and neatly done on its own. These were the most blissful moments. It was hard only when he had to stop this by now unconscious movement and think, when he had to mow around a tussock, or an unweeded clump of sorrel. The old man did it easily. The tussock would come. He would change movement, and using the heel or tip of the scythe, cut around it on both sides with short strokes. And as he did so, he studied and observed what opened up before him. Now he picked off a corn flag, ate it or offered it to Levine, now flung aside a branch with the tip of his scythe, or examined a quail's nest from which the female had flown up right under the scythe, or caught a snake that had gotten his way, and picking it up with the scythe of the fork, showed it to Levine and tossed it aside. For Levine and the young lad behind him, these changes of movement were difficult. Both of them, having got into one strenuous rhythm, were caught up in the passion of work, and were unable to change it, and at the same time observe what was in front of them. Levine did not notice how the time passed. If he'd been asked how long he'd been mowing, he would have said half an hour, 
yet it was nearly dinner time. Walking back down the suave, the old man drew Levine's attention to the girls and boys, barely visible, coming towards the mowers from different directions, through the tall grass and along the road, their little arms weighed down with bundles of bread and jugs of glass stoppered with rags. See the midges come crawling, he said, pointing to them, and he looked at the sun from under his hand. They finished two more swaths, and the old man stopped. Well, master, it's dinner time, he said resolutely. And having reached the river, the mowers set out across the swaths toward their captains, near which the children who had brought their dinners sat waiting for them. The musics gathered together, those from far away under their carts, those from nearby under a willow bush on which they heaped some grass. Levine sat down with them. He did not want to leave. Any constraint before the master had long since vanished. The musics were preparing to have dinner. Some were washing. The young fellows were bathing in the river. Others were preparing a place to rest, untying sacks of bread and unstopping jugs of glass. The old man crumbled some bread into a bowl, kneaded it with a spoon handle, poured in some water from his whetstone box, cut more bread, sprinkled in some salt, and turned eastward to pray. Here, master, try a bit of my mash, he said, squatting down in front of the bowl. And the mash tasted so good that Levine changed his mind about going home for dinner. He ate it with the old man and got to talking with him about his domestic affairs, taking a lively interest in them, and told him about all his own affairs and all circumstances that might interest the old man. He felt closer to him than to his brother, and involuntarily stood up again. Missed a sentence. He felt closer to him than to his brother, and involuntarily smiled from the tenderness that he felt for this man. When the old man stood up again, prayed, and lay down right there under the bush, putting some grass under his head, Levine did the same, and despite the flies and bugs, clinging, persistent in the sunlight, tickling his sweaty face and body, he fell asleep at once and awoke only when the sun had passed over the other side of the bush and begun to reach him. The old man had long been awake and sat wetting the young fellow's sides. Levine looked around him and did not recognize the place. Everything was so changed. An enormous expanse of the meadow had been mowed, and its already fragrant swaths shone with a special new shine in the slanting rays of the evening sun. They mowed round bushes by the river. The river itself, invisible before, but now shining like steel in its curves the peasants stirring and getting up, the steep wall of grass at the unmowed side of the meadow, and the hawks wheeling above the bared meadow. All this was completely new. Coming to his senses, Levine began to calculate how much had been mowed and how much more could be done that day. They had done an extraordinary amount of work for forty-two men. The whole of the big meadow, which in the time of the Corvée used to be mowed in two days by thirty scythes, was already mowed. Only some corners with short swaths remained unmowed. But Levine wanted to get as much mowed as possible that day, and was vexed with the sun for going down so quickly. He felt no fatigue at all. He only wanted to work more and more quickly, and get as much done as possible. What do you think? Can we still tow or mow Mashka's knoll? He said to the old man. As God wills, the sun's not high. Or might there be some vodka for the lads? At break time, when they sat down again and the smokers lit up, the old man announced to the lads that if they mow Mashka's knoll, there'll be vodka in it. See if we can't. Go to it, Titus. We'll clear it in a wink. You can eat tonight. Go to it, came the cries, and finishing their bread, the mowers went to it. Well, lads, keep the pace, said Titus, and he went ahead almost at a trot. Get a move on, said the old man, hustling after him and catching up easily. 
I'll gut you down. Watch out. And it was as if young and old vied with each other in the mowing. But no matter how they hurried, they did not ruin the grass. And the swaths were laid as evenly and neatly as they could. A little patch left in a corner was cleared in five minutes. The last mowers were coming to the end of their rows when the ones in the front threw their caftans over their shoulders and went across the road to Mashka's knoll. The sun was already low over the trees when, with wet stone boxes clanking, they entered the wooded gully of Mashka's knoll. The grass was waist-high in the middle of the hollow, tender and soft, broad-bladed, speckled with cow wheat here and there under the trees. After a brief discussion, to move lengthwise or crosswise, Prokhor Yermelin, also a famous mower, a huge, swarthy man, went to the front. He finished the first swath, went back and mowed over, and everybody started falling into line after him, going downhill through the hollow and up to the very edge of the wood. The sun sank behind the wood, and the dew was already falling, and only those mowing on the hill were in the sun, while below where the mist was rising, and on the other side, they walked in the fresh, dewy shade. The work was in full swing. Sliced down with a succulent sound and smelling of spice, the grass lay in high swaths, crowding on all sides in the short swaths, their wet stone boxes clanking, to the noise of scythes clashing, of a wet stone swishing along a sharpening blade, and of merry shouts the mowers urged each other on. Levin went as before between the young lad and the old man. The old man, who had put on his sheepskin jacket, was just as gay, jocular and free in his movements as ever. In the wood they were constantly happening upon boletous mushrooms, sodden in the succulent grass, which their scythes cut down. But the old man, each time he met a mushroom, bent down, picked it up, and put it into his jacket. Another treat for my old woman, he would mutter. Easy as it was to mow the wet and tender grass, it was hard going up and down the steep slopes of the gully. But the old man was not hindered by that, swinging his scythe in the same way, with the small, firm steps of his feet shod in the big, fast shoes, he slowly climbed up the steep slope, and despite the trembling of his whole body, and of his trousers hanging lower than his shirt, he did not miss a single blade of grass, or a single mushroom on his way, and joked with the music and Levine just as before. Levine came after him, and often thought that he would surely fall, going up such a steep slope with a scythe, where it was hard to climb, even without a scythe. But he climbed it, and did what was needed. He felt that some external force moved him. If you enjoy this format, please leave a like and subscribe and return tomorrow for the next chapter.